probably was founded in 1888 by renowned suffragist and activist Maywright Sewell as a place where women and women's groups could meet and share ideas. We carry on that tradition today through our mission as the place that connects and celebrates women. Our mission and focus is women's leadership, arts and culture, and historic preservation. As a nonprofit, we count on your support to provide engaging programming like tonight. Please take a look at our website, www.thepropyleum.org, for all of our upcoming virtual events and to support the Propyleum. Uh, we hope that you'll join us at the Propyleum when we're all able to gather together again in person. Our program tonight features Jordan Ryan. Jordan is an architectural historian, archivist, and activist scholar. Uh, Jordan most recently managed the Indianapolis Bicentennial Collecting Initiative and curated the Indianapolis Bicentennial Exhibition for the Indiana Historical Society. Jordan has a master's degree in public history from IUPUI and a bachelor's degree in art history from Heron School of Art and Design. Jordan's scholarship revolves around the built environment, urban planning, historic preservation, marginalized communities, hostile architecture, and LGBTQ historic sites. Jordan, welcome. Thanks, Liz, for having me tonight. And thanks to everyone who logged in on this snowy evening to join us. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance for sounding so scratchy. I promise my voice isn't normally this abrasive, but that's the way it's going to be. Um, so I've got my tea, and hopefully we can make it through the next 50 minutes or so. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about the archives and Indianapolis architectural history and what we're doing for the Indianapolis Bicentennial. So I'm going to start with a brief outline. Uh, so I'm going to kind of start with what the archives is and how we build archives and what that entails and then talk about some of my favorite Indianapolis Bicentennial <laughs> collections that I got to work on while sort of building this new archive. And then I'll wrap with some of the upcoming activities with the Indianapolis Bicentennial Commission, things that you can do online, things that um, you can do hopefully once it's safe for us to all meet again. So a little bit about what makes an archive. First, um, when you get the material, which it would be a whole separate sort of talk to talk about um, getting materials and, and working with donors and sort of how you uh, think about um, engagement and bringing in collections, but let's just start with the premise that the materials have been donated to the archive, to the repository. Uh, the first thing I get to do is really dive into the content and arrange the material or process it. Uh, that's what the archiving part is of the archives. Um, so one way to think of that is taking this content, figuring out what the collection really is, the best way to organize it, placing it in some sort of system so it will be easy to be cataloged. So it's easy for researchers to, to you know, get into the material, figure out what it is, if it's worth their time for their project. And a lot of the common things that an architectural archivist gets to archive are things like planning reports, which you see here on the left, and then written building specifications, which you see on the right. Um, it's a really old building spec from Sharn and Rubish, which is the precursor to Rubish and Hunter that you may know as the great architects that did Circle Tower, Coca-Cola bottling plant, many great buildings downtown. Um, so these are the types of materials I commonly play with in my, my work. After you arrange and archive the content, the next step is to figure out how to store it best. Um, so this really revolves around placing the material in the appropriate type of container for the ease of use, the ease of retrieval, um, the safety and sort of stability of these items. So for here, the examples I have are on the left, you can see some um, large scale sort of blueprint or architectural rending, rendering drawing folders. So these are in flat files um, to make it easy to pull each folder out uh, without having too many stacked upon each other. And then on the right, you see sort of a, a smaller box. These are actually, uh, it's photo documentation of different projects and they're in these, these smaller photo boxes. And both of these examples come from the Evans Wolin architectural firm, which is a great mid-century modern architectural collection, which I encourage you to explore if you're into mid-century modern 
architecture. I, I think that's one of the, the strengths um, at this archive. So figuring out your storage for all of your materials is next. And then after that is considering what kind of conservation and long-term care needs you may have. Um, so this really revolves around working with conservators on stabilizing the archival materials, deciding on unique storage situations and solutions. Um, you might have some use issues. So for example, the most common type of conservation issue that an architectural archivist is gonna have are these torn renderings and drawings. Like this is really common, particularly with the older paper. Um, some people refer to it as like onion skin paper. It's just really delicate paper that no one expected to last this long. And a lot of these um, rolls aren't usually kept in tubes or in flat files. So those edges really get beaten up. Um, so sadly, this is one of the biggest headaches you find working in architectural archives and, and figuring out how to stabilize this, usually um, putting it in some sort of plastic wrap or um, attaching it to some sort of board. Um, a lot of times, uh, it, it takes a long time to, to deal with this. And it's uh, really common when you're talking about thousands upon thousands of drawings, like you tend to get with a lot of these big prolific firms. After that, um, some archivists, and sometimes this is more on the library side of an archives, but the next step would be to catalog these collections and to create finding aids or collection guides. So this is really about developing a language to describe the information that's in these materials, right? It's how the researchers, it's how all these library patrons will search and locate these collections. Um, so for example, here on the left, I have just a screenshot of what a catalog system looks like that a lot of the libraries use in town. And on the right, I have a just a page from a finding aid that I created for the Evans Woolen collection. And I just wanna note that um, as an architectural archivist, I tend to be really neurotic about tracking addresses because you know, a lot of buildings, the name can change over time. Um, the owner can change over time. So it doesn't always make sense to just have the name of the original owner. Um, so using an address, which, you know, addresses do change occasionally, but that's a whole nother conversation, uh, but keeping track of addresses is pretty important for finding aids for architectural collections. And then also there can be some form of digitization. Um, so sometimes architectural materials are digitized because they will be useful, um, possibly for exhibits or programs or tours, um, possibly for research purposes. Other times they are digitized simply to avoid physically handling them ever again because they're so delicate and it's seen as like the best way to preserve the item. Um, so generally I would say photographs tend to be the most digitized out of architectural collections because they're just so helpful for all sorts of research. Um, drawings a little bit less and then your written specifications tend to only be copied over usually just Xerox when it really matters for a potential historic preservation redevelopment project. Like those tend to not show up online. And so here I have an example of um, one of my favorite drawings. It's a mural from the Rubish and Hunter collection. I just thought it was really cute. It's the, the Juncker residence um, on North Meridian Street. So this was just a concept for a mural in their living room which I wasn't expecting to find when I processed that collection. And then on the right, I have a screenshot just showing you an example of what a digital collection might look like for, for an architectural uh, materials. And again, that's from, from my guy, Evans Wollen and some of his brutalist buildings in town. And then lastly, um, sort of the last step to being an archivist and what goes into an archive is the outreach and engagement. You know, you have to share your collections and be your own cheerleader for them or else how do people know they exist? Uh, they probably won't. So I take the outreach and engagement part of my job pretty seriously because that's sort of how you generate new collections and new donations and, and new collaborations. 
And so a lot of the sort of architectural outreach um, includes public talks like this and uh, things like walking and biking tours, blogs, other forms of digital scholarship, uh, certainly PR and media. You know, I get a lot of um, hits from the local news stations about, you know, they want some sort of historic item or photograph for context for a story. Um, certainly other types of reference work for different institutions and individuals in town, lots of education and curriculum development and scholarship like articles and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of different ways to sort of showcase new collections that you might be getting out to the public that you want them to see. Here are a couple examples on the left is a property map from the Rubish and Hunter archive. Uh, so I'm a big nerd if you didn't, if you couldn't tell. And I actually map every property in each architectural collection that I process. So I go through with a spreadsheet and I, I map them with the address and then I have a coding system for what's still standing, you know, what's extant and what's demolished. And sometimes I'll get really nerdy and even have categories of like what's been altered or what has an addition. And I just sort of, I don't know what the data is gonna tell me, but sometimes you can see some pretty obvious trends. Like there's more that will be demolished in the downtown core and maybe less in the suburbs like you can see here with the Rubish and Hunter map. But sometimes this is useful for, for different um, sort of reference questions that come up with, with architectural firms and things like that, and people that own property from um, any of these architects. So that's why I do that. And then on the right is just a screenshot from a blog post I had done that was pretty popular. It was a it was a sort of a fantasy of what White River State Park could be that never came to fruition uh, due to funding in some different state versus municipal policy issues. Uh, but I, I really enjoy unbuilt and rejected architectural proposals. I think they're really fun to think about and, and reimagine. All right, so why do I do this work? What's sort of the power of the archives? Um, you know, they're important for a lot of reasons. I have <clears throat> reasons listed on this slide, uh, but I really wanna talk about two that um, kind of keep me going every day. And the first one is architectural archives literally save buildings and spaces. And what I mean is that every so often you get a really cool project where where a developer wants to do some sort of historic preservation of an old site or an old structure and they need to know how it was built how it was designed here i have an example of the coca-cola bottling plant from the rubish and hunter collection and you know they needed to know how all of these terracotta panels came together on the facade and how they were structured and that information was accessible to them because I had archived the collection and they could see the written specifications and they could see these renderings and figure out how to properly restore it. That's really exciting to me. Um, I'm not saying that just because you don't have the architectural archival material, things are going to get demolished, but they may not be able to be restored at the level that like you know, on a historic preservation level that I can be really, really proud of. I do think that my role as an archivist is sort of helping these developers and their, you know, subcontractors and the craftspeople that work on these things day to day, giving them some clues on how the original architects and builders were thinking about these things um, definitely gives me some steam. Another thing I think is worth pointing out um, that we kind of don't talk about a lot outside of the library is building collections is how historians do history. So there's sort of a fine line between what's the role of the historian and what's the role of the archivist. And I consider myself more of an archivist. So it's not my job to know everything. It's my job to know how to get the answers for, for any sort of question. Um, but it's not necessarily my job to, to rattle off the history off the top of my head. I, I find information and I hoard information and I organize information. And so much of Indianapolis is sort of this 
this void of scholarship. You know, we don't always get written about in national kind of history texts that might be comparing different cities. Um, it's really hard for historians to talk about Indianapolis and to study us when we don't have an archive. So building archival collections so that I can show the historians, hey, look at this stuff. You should do a book on this, helps get Indianapolis sort of in that national context. And that's really important to me. And it's not to say that we don't have a city archive. We don't have an official city archive. We have lots of different libraries and repositories that like collect some stuff. So it's really kind of the art of figuring out who has what stuff and figuring out what stuff is just sort of slipping through the cracks, you know, sitting in warehouses, sitting in filing cabinets in the city county building. Um, so that's another reason that I get really excited about doing my job is sort of providing the content so that historians can put Indianapolis sort of in that um, scholarly map. So speaking of archives and sort of building a city collection, I'm gonna pivot now to talk about the Indianapolis Bicentennial and building that city archives. So now that you've kind of seen what goes into building an archive, you can sort of trace the steps that I've been going through about the last two, two and a half years. So we were tasked with developing a collecting initiative <coughs> and exhibit for the Indianapolis Bicentennial at the Indiana Historical Society. And I was really excited, but also frustrated with the fact that we didn't have one guiding place to go. Pardon for one second. All right, so instead <coughs> I'm looking at collections throughout the city at numerous libraries and archives in town and looking at the city of Indianapolis as in the, you know, the city county building, what do they have? What's been sitting around in the corner? What has no one wanted to sort of go through? Or maybe someone's retired and they left a bunch of things behind and no one knows what to do with them. Or what's, what's sitting in a warehouse somewhere that no one's looked at in 40 years. And that was really, really exciting. So we were developing new collections, working with the city, Sometimes um, the city and other institutions didn't want to outright donate material. So instead we did what's called a digitized loan, which is simply we scan the item and make a digital collection and return the physical. But then I also got to go through the backlog of collections at the Historical Society and sort of triage things that needed to be part of this initiative and needed to be archived and, and celebrated. Um, so from all of that, I was sort of managing the project from its acquisition through its research and processing. Um, some of it gets digitized all the way through to the outreach. And eventually, um, you know, you start with this giant mass and then like just a, a tiny dot is what ends up going in the exhibit, believe it or not. But all of that work to sort of get to that product at the end. So what were we archiving? What was I sort of building? Um, obviously with my background as an architectural archivist, for me, everything was centered around the built environment. So when I say the built environment, I mean the things that are man-made. So the buildings themselves, but also sort of the city planning and like planning and zoning and the land use theory that goes into that, the infrastructure, the utilities, it's all one complicated network that all tells a story about how we live, you know, where we live or where some of us can live, how we get to work, what kind of amenities we have access to. Like that's sort of this overall story that impacts all of us. Um, so thinking about both downtown, but also neighborhoods, thinking about sort of change over time and the city expanding and developing I was particularly interested in stories about labor and working class and countercultural critical narratives. Um, because if I was just telling sort of a city booster story, then I'm failing to be an archivist. Like there, there's a bias there. And there's there's a lot of stories out there about, 
you know, the sports initiative and UNIGOV and building a skyline, but like, how do we get at sort of the tensions that existed throughout all of these historic policies and how they impact uh, particularly working class and marginalized communities. And I just love, um, I like telling difficult and uncomfortable and challenging histories because I like to make people uncomfortable. <laughs> um, so the collecting initiative was both a physical archive and a digital archive, um, but a lot of the work was also providing sort of historic expertise and reference materials to the city's official Bicentennial Commission as well. And then obviously curating the exhibit and the re related programs. So for the next part of this, um, I have a screenshot of what the digital collection um, homepage looks like. If you wanna check it out, the link is on the left. Um, so this is probably my proudest effort, my proudest baby from this whole thing is building this digital collection. You can see the list of all of the um, different collections here that made it. So a lot of times um, if something was processed and archived, maybe like the most interesting, useful, historic information from that collection would be digitized. So maybe about 25%, like what I thought was the best, most reflective of the collection. Other collections are just straight digital collections. So the whole thing is digitized, but ultimately we got up to about 2,300 images are in this collection. And then there's some items, uh, things like diaries and journals that are actually like hundreds and thousands of pages, but that just counts as one in the 2,300 number. Um, so this is probably my proudest baby. And then the next few slides I show you all come from this digital collection for your reference. So let's talk a little bit about some of the interesting collections that I got to play with over the last two years. Uh, the first one is the Department of Waterworks collection. So this collection uh, has to do with the city water company and sort of uh, water history and supply and infrastructure over time. And I thought it was important because we could really ask the question, how do we get at neighborhood and community stories through infrastructure and utilities in the landscape? Um, so this collection encompassed a very long time range. It was 1870 to 2001. It has 44 photo boxes. Like this is no easy feat. Um, it, this is a massive collection, 21 boxes of manuscript materials alone. And I think it's really helpful um, because we have really juicy photos like this. And I hope Sharon is excited right now from pictures like this. Um, but here is what I call walking the central canal. So this is just numerous shots, sort of walking different parts of that early canal, you know, not the canal we think of today, but what it originally looked like. And you're getting these little glimpses of, you know, vernacular workers' cottages that were definitely built in the Civil War era and like factories. Like a lot of this stuff is long gone. And sometimes we don't always get these views from, you know, a lot of these historic sort of architecture collections that were being saved and, and highlighted for so long tend to be, you know, your manners and your sort of nice residences, but getting these, these little glimpses of what the downtown sort of industrial area looked like, you know, at the time the Central Canal was essentially a, a trench. It was a garbage disposal for a lot of these manufacturers. And I just, there's, you know, a good number of, of photos like this where someone from the water company just took the time to walk the whole canal and document it. And I, I think it's beautiful. I also think um, we really can get at some environmental justice issues that we're grappling with today as a society. I've noticed a lot in the last five years or so, um, the environmental justice movement is really starting to get into the what's the historical context of how did we get here beyond um, just like the science and the data of it? Like, let's dive into the history. So I about fell out of my chair when we found this in the, the collection. <coughs> so it's a whole scrapbook in the 1910s documenting all the sources of pollution going into White River. 
Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so it's mostly looking at the canneries, the slaughterhouses, things like that. And this plays a huge role in how we're dealing with White River today. And I think that this is going to be monumentally helpful as we grapple with these questions on how we clean up White River. The next collection I'm really excited about is the GM stamping plant collection. Um, I don't know if you've been following all the hoopla over there as we're waiting to possibly redevelop the site again, but when it closed, all of the materials sort of in their office were, were donated to the society. And I think that we have a great opportunity here to reshape sort of this area so close to downtown. So it's a once in a lifetime kind of space sort of location, but I really wanted to study the neighborhood that was directly impacted by this and ask that question, how do we get at neighborhood and community stories through business and industry and labor? I think there's a lot to chew on here. One of the most provocative images in this collection for me was seeing the GM sort of corporate admin people just strategically planning how they were going to acquire the land to expand the plant and expand the parking lot. So if you can't read uh, the small text on the map, it says, you know, under option, future acquisition. So, you know, they're just piecemeal kind of cutting this neighborhood up. And like, these are homes that would look very much like what you see in Bates Hendricks or the Old South Side or Cottage Home. Like this was a very dense neighborhood still. So um, thinking about displacement, thinking about land use changing over time, I think it's important to, to use this as an example of, of sort of that tension between industry and neighborhoods. I know we're not supposed to have like a favorite kid, but this is definitely my favorite kid in the collection. Um, so this was a, a loan for digitization from the Department of Metropolitan Development. And this collection knocks me off my socks because it is documenting mostly Center Township, Indianapolis um, over time, but their intersections and neighborhoods prior to uh, historic preservation, like district status or like landmark status, prior to demolitions, prior to redevelopment. And it's like this fleeting era where sort of the, the known historic photo collections of Indy kind of end, you know, like Bass photo kind of ends in the 50s or Larry Foster kind of ends in the 70s or 80s. But this collection really captures the 1970s to the 1990s. And like, yeah, I think most of us were alive for most of that, if not all, um, but it's still history. So like we have to think about how we sort of capture and, and remember that lost era. And um, it's just, it's a total gem of a collection. It's very, very useful for understanding sort of how sites change, you know, often over time. And I was really hoping we could use the DMD collection to ask that question of how do neighborhoods and community stories sort of, um, what can we learn about them from an ever changing built environment? And I've, uh, I've included here the untitled Roland Hobart mural, um, which is a bicentennial project to be restored. So like finding this original photo of it in its former beauty, is really important. And on the right is Indiana Avenue. You can see the Walker Theater in the background. Um, you know, a lot of these buildings have been demolished for new structures and parking lots. Here's some more images. From DMD, I love a good architectural model. Um, so that is that model of White River State Park. Uh, what could have been, we could have had an amusement park and a boardwalk and lots, uh, lots of things, an uh, absurdly tall tower, um, but we didn't get any of those. And then on the right, this is pretty reflective what a lot of DMDs documenting um, sort of demolitions, uh, you know, demolition by neglect, a lot of that and, and sort of just looking at um, a lot of great buildings that were lost. And then the last collection I wanna talk about is Indigo and their transit materials. So it's, it's all the private public transit companies that happened before Indigo. 
And I think that this collection will tell us a lot about neighborhoods and development and how people use space and how they access space. Um, it's, it's a smaller collection, but what I really like about it is there's a lot of glimmers of areas that we don't normally see in historic documentation. So I, I lost my mind when I saw this picture on the right because that's uh, in the Market Square Arena area. And I had never seen what it looked like right before it all got demoed for the arena. Um, a lot of times sort of anti-preservationists will always come at you with this, well, you don't know how bad a building was before it's demolished. Like they think that preservationists are very, you know, we're very romantic and we're just remembering like in at its best. And like, you know, they always want to justify demolishing things because they're in such a horrible condition. Um, so I'm, I've been more actively trying to find pictures of buildings that I'm interested in, like right before they get demolished to sort of, uh, you know, have a rebuttal before that comes up. Um, so I really enjoyed finding that image of the Star Hotel and some other really just quaint downtown structures. And then on the left, um, you can see more of that sort of uh, streetcar infrastructure. And, you know, a lot of this, they keep digging up this kind of infrastructure as they're building um, the new bus rapid transit line. So it's just kind of amusing to me thinking about how history repeats itself, how a lot of these lines are in the same places and uh, thinking about things like how the city was built, where sort of the, the dense commercial corridors were, where, uh, there's more density, there's gonna be more of a justification for mass transit lines, right? Uh, so one of the most interesting artifacts in this entire collection was about a 50 page pamphlet of uh, every map they had drawn from 1864 to 1921 of the transit lines. So I know they say railway lines, but they don't mean like railroad, they mean like streetcars. Um, so I just have the first and the last one here to show you, but it's it's like a, almost like a flip book where you can watch the city expand and develop and see which areas expand first because it's the same sort of movement as uh, obviously where these lines go and it's just so fascinating to me. So like this whole artifact is available in the Indigo digital collection. So if you wanted to scroll through and see each one, they're all available. Um, and it's very similar to what our current transit and future transit design will look like, which is just tickles me. So now I'm going to pivot a little bit now that you've seen some of my favorite collections and talk more about the actual bicentennial and what it means for the city and what we can do and how you can learn more. Uh, so the first thing I wanna share is the official website for the Bicentennial Commission. It's called Indy Turns 200. The link is there at the top right. Um, so this is the site for all things related to the Bicentennial. Um, every collaborator, every institution, every project is linked from this site. So you can learn about what everyone's been up to, what everyone's doing. Um, you can stay up to date on the new projects and new events that are coming out. Um, it's pretty, it's, it's kept up to date and you can um, find out more about who's sort of planning different events, who's on the official commission. Um, there's, you know, news and PR, all that's available here. And one thing we did a couple weeks ago to kick off Founders Day for January 6 was a virtual activity for students uh, recommended third through sixth grade, but predominantly fourth grade. Um, so this was really, really fun to work on, a different way to sort of celebrate archival material, get it out to the public, but make it uh, make it fun for kids. So I got to sneak in a little bit of primary sources and also talk about cartography and sort of surveying. Um, so to celebrate the city's official birthday, January 6th, um, the commission had asked me to develop this virtual program and the lesson introduces the students to the original sort of mile square map, you know, the Ralston plan. And it allows uh, the, the students to compare and contrast the original mile square to what downtown looks like today. And then they design their own maps based off of the elements of the Ralston plan and learn about Indianapolis history. Uh, for example, I have snuck in um, the General Assembly Act, 
which is like officially like declaring, you know, January 6, 1821, the birthday of Indianapolis. So they're, they're getting a little bit of primary source knowledge, um, but mostly they're getting to make maps. So like this sheet is a cutout sheet and it's showing, you know, we've got the White River, we've got uh, Pogues Run, we've got a hundred squares and a circle. <coughs> the apples stand for the original markets that were designed. Um, we've got a seat for state government, seat for county government. And then we have these little blue squares with the leaf actually stand for parks because they had originally planned um, six like little parks throughout the mile square. So let the kids sort of design their own city and then show them the original mile square plan. Uh, hopefully, you know, we're building a whole army of, of young urban planners, um, but this was a lot of fun to work on and it's available back on this website. If you go to the projects tab, it'll be one of the most recent projects at the end of the list. Um, so if you've got kids or grandkids that you think would like this activity, please share it because I really just want to see everyone's maps. I think it's it's a fun way to think about city planning and, and the like. Another thing you can do if you're more of sort of a, you like to listen, you like a little bit of a lecture, um, I encourage you to check out Hoosier History Live for their 575th episode. Um, I was on a couple weeks ago to talk about that debate about Indianapolis's real birthday. Is it June 7th, 1820, or is it January 6, 1821. Um, so we sort of talk about the Indiana Journal Assembly Act. Um, we talk about some of our, the lost historic landmarks that we like really just lament over. Um, so we talked about English's theater and hotel and opera house, uh, the JC Penney store, which is a debate in of itself, uh, the cyclorama, which is included on this illustration uh, from an 1888 Harper's Weekly supplement. And then of course the Essex house. Um, and then we talk a little bit about the bicentennial sort of exhibit and initiative and what's coming up. So the link is there. Um, it's a recorded podcast. So you can just click on the link and it'll come up like any other audio file on your browser. Um, but that's available if you'd like to learn more about all things bicentennial. Another thing, uh, worth looking at if you're into more of um, more of like a planning, zoning kind of equity and history. Um, I encourage you to check out the Living the Legacy Redlining Program series. Um, so that was something we did to kick off the Bicentennial exhibit. Um, it's a four part program series exploring redlining as a policy and how it has negatively impacted neighborhoods and communities today. Um, so I, I know that a lot of the early bicentennial planning was very celebratory in nature, but I felt it was important to sort of have one challenging and difficult kind of event to think about, um, you know, all, not all history is, is great or um, forward thinking and like we're still dealing with these consequences today and like how can we learn from it to better plan for an equitable future when it comes to housing and planning. Um, it was an incredible program series. We worked with a lot of amazing local collaborators and you can view um, all the organizations, you can view the recordings. We have a whole list of resources and suggested readings and uh, different things you can play with online at this toolkit. The link is at the bottom of the screen. So for some upcoming projects uh, that I've got going on that relate to the Bicentennial, if you're interested, uh, four things. The first, which was announced today, um, is a research fellowship to continue this redlining research for Indianapolis. Um, it's part of the Indiana Humanities Wilma Gibbs Moore research uh, project series. Um, so I'll be continuing that redlining research and I'm happy to share it with you. So. If you do, you know, affordable housing or housing law, or um, if you're a realtor, I get a lot of real estate agents who are interested in, in their sort of role in this. Um, I've got lots of content information I'm happy to share. Um, so I'll be working on that in the next few months. 
Um, also really exciting, if you haven't followed the, the city's uh, People's Planning Academy, every two years they do this program series to help everyday people kind of learn the language of planners so that you can be better at sort of remonstrating on behalf of your neighborhood. So for the theme for this year, they decided to go with the bicentennial and do 200 years of planning. So they'll be looking at all aspects of planning and sort of land history. And I'm a content curator for that. So that should be um, dropping with some more news in the next month or two. Um, also, if Amy's still on, shout out to the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana. Um, I'll be speaking about uh, sort of the redlining content and sort of uh, just different inequitable planning policies for Indianapolis at the upcoming Fair Housing Conference, which is a really great interdisciplinary conference if any of you are interested. And then last um, in May, sort of wrapping up the city's official bicentennial year celebration will be the book launch for the Belt Indianapolis Anthology. Um, I have an article in there with Dr. Paul Mullins called Imagining the Black Crossroads, Music and Memory on Indiana Avenue. And there's, uh, it's a good mix of historic essays and then poetry and more literary works. And there's going to be an unreleased poem from Etheridge Knight. And I'm freaking out and honored to be part of a book that has an Etheridge Knight poem in it. Uh, so you can pre-order the book from Belt Publishing now available at that link. Uh, so thanks for following along on all things Indianapolis Archives and the Bicentennial. Um, if you couldn't tell, I found myself unemployed a few weeks ago, so I started my own independent research consulting firm called the History Concierge. Um, so I'm available for all sorts of architectural history and archival projects. Um, mostly, you know, looking at building history, um, land use and planning, um, interpretation, and certainly archival collections for, for individuals or businesses. So feel free to contact me. My information's on this slide, my email, my website, which um, can take you to my email as well. You can also tweet at me. Um, sometimes I'm really active on Twitter and I can get back to you if you have a a quick question. Um, so I am available for public talks and research and all things sort of buildings in Indianapolis. Uh, so thank you for bearing with me in this horrible <laughs> voice, uh, but I think we have time to take some questions now. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jordan. Yeah, we have um, just a handful of questions here and I know we're gonna try and stick to an hour, so I'm gonna um, get to as many of these as I can. Um, one, where do you store all the archival collections you've developed? Well, so yeah, it's um, you can't be an archivist without an archive, I've learned in the last couple of weeks. Uh, so for the last five and a half years, I worked at the Indiana Historical Society. So any collections that were donated are stored at the Indiana Historical Society's archive. Um, a few things were just loans to be digitized. So those things went back to the city government but the digital collection lives on that um, digital collection page I showed you earlier. Um, before that, I, I worked at the Heron Art Library for a while. And while they didn't really have their own archive, the archive lived at the IUPUI archive. So, you know, those collections tended to live over there. Um, and then I worked at the in Indiana Landmarks Library between Heron and the Historical Society. And, and they have their own archive, but they have been um, loaning it out to IUPUI to digitize so it's accessible. So typically things live with the institution. Occasionally you'll find that some of these collections stay with the individual and they just um, let me borrow things to scan. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's more challenging, digging through to find older, older archival materials or trudging through new information since we now have a huge data dump? Oh yeah, that's really, really hard. So I guess it depends how how far back we're going because there's a certain point where like the whole primary source versus secondary source debate and like if there's a newspaper article from 1860 talking about something that happened in 1830 it's not a primary source it's some it's like hearsay from 30 years later like 
you and I can't remember a story exactly from 30 years ago. Uh, so definitely looking through historic stuff, if you have like a specific question or mystery you're trying to solve, there's a good chance with like that first generation of Indianapolis, you know, pioneer settlers, it's really hard to document some of that stuff. Um, it's, it's a real mystery and you, you have to jump and make a lot of, um, make a lot of conclusions that like make me uncomfortable. Like I want to see something documented twice before I believe it. Uh, but I hope, you know, I hope, and this is sort of a side tangent, but I hadn't mentioned it. There's two things that really excite me about the Bicentennial Collection that get at that first generation of Indianapolis pioneers that prove like this person was here in the first few years. And that's um, the Department of Public Works. Um, we have different annexation petitions for these different neighborhoods, but also the uh, McCormick Ledger, which you can view online, shows different early pioneer families that were here when Indianapolis was just establishing. And you see a lot of these family names and you're like, oh, well, this guy's grandson gets a street named after him and you can start connecting the dots. Uh, so yeah, I would definitely say the older stuff. I'm going through newer stuff where it's a data dump. I'd rather have more and whittle it down to less than be starting with like, a, you know, not a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, let's see, Lorraine wanted to know, do you have a favorite um, Rubish and Hunter designed building in Indianapolis? Oh, that's so hard. Um, so I'm a huge Art Deco lover. I don't know why I'm this way. I've always been this way. Like I probably reincarnated from someone in Miami or something. Um, so I'm going to go with Coca-Cola bottling plant, but Circle Tower every once in a while, um, just it takes my heart. So it's probably a tie between those two. Okay. And uh, did you, um, on Hoosier History Live, did you come to a conclusion on what is the actual uh, date? Uh, is it in June or is it in June? <laughs> this date debate drives me nuts. Um, yeah, so the, the June 7th date is of the, the commissioners coming here and like picking the site. And then the January 1821 date is like the date of the General Assembly enacting it, right? Acknowledging it. And from a historian's perspective, you tend to take these official like legislative dates to be the dates. Like that's just the way the field is, um, which kind of makes me uncomfortable because I do think that the commissioners coming here in the summer and being like, oh, White River, Pokes Run, this will work out. Like don't mind the mosquitoes, it's not that swampy. Like, I do think that's relevant. So what I liked about the city sort of skirting the issue and not accepting either one as the official date was they decided to just take both of them and then celebrate for a year. And then that allows you to spread things out, which mm -hmm. hasn't really helped in COVID times. Like I hope before the end of this party, we can get together and do something. But I like that their, their option was let's acknowledge both dates, not make it a this or that because for the centennial, they had gone with the June 1820 date, but for the sesquicentennial, you know, for the 150th, they had gone with the, the 1821 January. And like some people say that's just because they were busy in 1970 dealing with UNIGOV. I don't know, it could go either way, but I, I like the idea of like, let's just acknowledge both dates, like they both are relevant and let's just make this a party for a year. Yeah, yeah. Um, one more question and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, what's your favorite Indianapolis fact, folklore or unsolved mystery? <laughs> Whoa, I've never been asked that before. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna see if my dad's still on here because this is not PG, he's still on. All right, well, my favorite mystery is trying to figure out this Madam's Stag House on the Old North Side where apparently men went to be serviced by men. And I can't find any documentation um, beyond just like hearsay of like this grand Victorian house and trying to do sort of sex worker history in the city is really hard because we don't mm -hmm. have like a robust uh, police archive that's like searchable and easy. Um, so it's like, it's kind of hard to do what prostitution and sex work history is if you don't have like 
accessible content. Um, but I'm obsessed with figuring this out. Like, where was this place? Who was <laughs> going there? When was it active? Um, Do you I have a time know. frame? <laughs> Do you know a time frame? 1960s. Oh, oh I, might that's not, that's, I might be able to help with that. That's okay. my biggest mystery. That's a mystery that has kept me up at night for years. I just want to know more. Okay, well, we are going to share, uh, again, we will send out after this, we'll share with you all of Jordan's, all of the, all of her information, her contact information. So if you have information on that, that you would like to share with her, uh, reach out. Um, if you have other questions, I'm sure that she would be so happy to answer them. And Jordan, we appreciate your being here so much. And I just was em envisioning, you know, 10 different programs I would love to have you do for us again. So thank you so much. I